living me low in this all sinful world. Hardly a comfort can afford. Striving on Lord to face temptation sore. Where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity that we have to assemble here this morning. We're thankful for the measure of health that we have and pray your continued blessings that you'll keep us healthy and active in thy service. We're mindful of the many that we know that are sick and struggling. We pray your blessings upon them. Help them to regain a full measure of health very, very soon. Pray that you'll bless us in thy service, that you will help us today to focus upon the sacrifice of your son and to think about the great and wonderful blessings that you've given to us, that truly we may worship you in spirit and in truth, do things to glorify your name and to be edified as a result of our being here today. Forgive us of our sins and bless us in thy service, we ask in Jesus' name, and amen. 495. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift and the cables drain? Will your anchor drift or firm remain? We Steadfast and short by the pillar's roar. Fasten to the rock which cannot move. Grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. When the rise behold through the gathering night, the city desire for mankind, and that is that none should perish, that all should come to a knowledge of truth and be saved. He said, the Lord's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want anyone to be lost. 
He has gone to extensive lengths to help us understand what can be done so that we might be saved. And he wants all to come to a knowledge of this truth. Over in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and going down to verse 4, here is Paul talking, is talking to Timothy about some of the things he should be preaching. He wants to remind folks that he will have all men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man of Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So God is wanting to teach all men. He's wanting all men to come to a knowledge of the truth and to be obedient to the dictates of Scripture. Now, as you think about imparting that knowledge, we think about, a, for example, a good teacher and what that teacher would try to do in helping educate the students in that classroom. You know, the teacher is going to, of course, respond quickly to those students that are eager to learn and to supply them with the needed information to help them learn and grow. But they're also going to take note of those in the class that are, shall, shall we say, a little more resistant to learning, that this is not exactly where they want to be or what they want to be doing. And the teacher doesn't just write them off and say, well, you know, sorry about their luck, but rather continually tries to find ways to strike up a chord of interest, to find some way that they'll want to learn the subject material that needs to be presented. The teacher is going to work with those that are very skilled and talented. They have a lot of good aptitudes that allow them to apply themselves to learning and to demonstrate that learning very, very quickly. But by the same token, they're looking also for the students of maybe more limited capability and to say, well, what can I do to help them have their moment in the sun? What can I do to help them to learn, to grow, and to benefit from the subject material that is being presented? You know, the teacher really works hard to, to find the best in all of the students. It's not coming to really quick, rapid decisions and, well, that one I like and that one I don't, this one I'll work with, that one that I don't work with, that they look at the whole class and what can I do for each and every one of my students to unlock their potential, to help them become more profitable in this society, more encouraged themselves, have a better degree of, of self-esteem as a result of what they've learned and what they've mastered. That's what a good teacher strives to do. Well, God, of course, is the best teacher of all. And he has that care and concern for all of us and demonstrated that, of course, by the sending of his son. The scriptures tell us that the prophets knew from of old time that the Son of God was going to be rejected and mistreated by many, but Jesus, as he came, understood his mission and knew how it was going to end, but yet he still came to be the sacrifice that man needed to have in order to have remission of one's sins. The familiar verse in John 3, 16 makes that point. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The point is to teach that highway of righteousness, what to do to be saved, and then how to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world so that heaven can be our home. So if I was to give my lesson a title this morning, I simply want to focus on the idea that God doesn't want to give up on us without a fight. He is doing everything that he can to try and trigger within man the interest that is necessary, the willingness to learn and obey that is necessary to help all men come to a knowledge of the truth. Of course, in the first place, what God has done to get that information out there is to send out the teachers that can present the truth. God did not expect us to all scratch this out by ourselves. But rather, as we find Philip talking with the, the Ethiopian, we find individuals who have knowledge of truth needing to have that ability to convey that to other folks. In Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, we talk about what we sometimes refer to as the Great Commission. He says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. The truth needs to be presented. We need to be echoing that forth in every format that we can find available to us. That's been one of the, I think, interesting discoveries that we've made, shall we say, as we've gone through all of this struggle with the coronavirus has been that, that we found new avenues and expanded avenues in which the truth can be taught. That if individuals are seeking truth, they have the opportunity to sit down and study that with individuals who are presenting it in various formats to help the truth be established. Over in Romans chapter 10, and going down to verse 13, Paul here talks about the importance of our embracing the word of the Lord. He said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So God put in place the role of teachers to help get the word out there. Now those teachers are not all preachers. We're some of that stock. But even as parents, we understand that all of us are going to be working to try and help our children to come to a knowledge of truth, that we want to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. As Paul talks about it over in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, he said, You fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. As parents, we have a role in teaching and instilling in our children the facts about the existence of God, the facts of how God wants a person to live, God's plan of salvation as to how they can be freed from the guilt of their sins as they reach that age of accountability. God is teaching, teaching, and reteaching through the mouth of various instructors to help all men come to a knowledge of the truth. Yes, evangelists work in that regard. Paul talked about his work in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23. He said, if you continue in the faith, grounded and rooted, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. He said, I'm one of them. I'm one of those fellows who tries to help individuals understand the right ways of the Lord. Many individuals may have a lot of adversity to that at the beginning, but that doesn't stop our trying to reach them with the, with the sensibilities of the gospel of Christ. It makes sense. It makes a logical conclusion of eternal life when we do what God wants us to do. But even beyond that, as God is not willing that any should perish, he's got evangelists working, he's got the parents working, he's got all Christians working to teach the truth. In Acts chapter 8 and going down to verse 4, we find what happens with the church at Jerusalem as persecutions develop. Whenever they are not able to safely stay in Jerusalem anymore, the Christians were dispersed. But notice what they did in verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. These Christians left Jerusalem, went to various cities throughout the Roman Empire, and as they went, they took the gospel with them. Numerous congregations were established. Churches began to grow and flourish in many different localities, all because Christians began to sit down with other people and help them understand the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's the one of the lines of presentation to keep all men from perishing. But then beyond that, we might go to another very effective way in which individuals are touched with the truth, and that's by the way in which they see it lived out in the lives of individuals who profess to be Christians. Those godly examples go a long way in helping folks understand that's what I want. I was involved in a, uh, a study this week kind of through long distance and through somebody in the middle, but somebody was realizing that their life was a mess. They kind of hit the wall. They tried to do things their way and it had failed time and time again. 
They were in another state. They were in another location. But they wanted to find the Lord. They wanted to be saved. They wanted to start turning their lives around. And so I made connection with the preacher in the community where this individual lived and worked to get them connected. And Lord willing, he'll be in worship services today to start learning this process. But what took him there was what he had seen in the life of his brother. He had a brother who was a Christian, a brother who's trying to do what's right. And as a result of that, he said, I want what you have. And that got him to questioning and inquiring about the right ways of the Lord. Our example goes a long way. That's what Paul was talking to Timothy about over in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and going down to verse 12. He said, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. When Christians live like Christians, we have confidence, we have joy, we have assurance that there's a better life beyond this one. And so we're not so intimidated by all of the adverse things that may come up in this life. Individuals of the world who are lost and struggling are anxious to find someone like that. How can you be cheerful in these times of calamity? How can you have peace in times of turmoil? We understand God's in control. And things are going to work out according to his will. And my job is to do the best that I can in the sphere of influence that I have. Over in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10 and going down to verse 11, we also find that it's not just in the godly examples of individuals that we can see in the flesh and that we can identify with, but the scriptures give us written examples of case after case after case of individuals who were affected by their faith in God. And it had something to do with their reactions to things, with their behaviors. And we can profit from their examples and see their faithfulness as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and going down to verse 11, Paul says, Now all these things happened unto them, for example, that they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. We see the good examples of individuals of faith, like people like Abraham, who was willing even to offer his only son Isaac, if that was what God wanted. Even to those examples of other individuals who chose to reject the right ways of God and then suffered all kinds of hardship and adversity because of their poor decision making. We have all those examples. And we can see what happened to them, and those can have an impact on us. It's like seeing somebody who has struggled and worked hard to overcome, but then they learned their trade or they learned the needed education that was required of them, and you watch them on through life and you see them become successful. And you say, it worked for them. See how all that fell together. I want to be like that. And that's why being a role model is so very, very important in helping others to understand not only things in the secular world, but that peaceful assurance that comes to the Christian as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and going down to verse 1, Paul said that we should be conducting our lives so that others want to be followers of us. Not followers of us in the sense of looking at us as, as saviors and special and wonderful people, but seeing the godliness exemplified in our lives, and they want that security too. In 1 Corinthians 11, in verse 1, he said, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. You know, over and over again in the scripture, individuals who were faithful children of God, trying to do that which is right, are individuals who are noticed by others in the world. And we are watched even today. Whenever Peter was uh, talking to uh, those that he wrote to in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1, he talks about here the important role that a wife may have in influencing an unbelieving husband by the way she lives, by the example that she sets. 
He said, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also uh, by if, if, let me try that again. If any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of their wives. As husbands that are unbelievers see the godliness in their wives, they begin to see traits that are worthy of imitation. So we also have the power of godly example that God can use in this struggle as he is trying to bring all men unto him. But even as we continue to think about how to live and how to serve God, we find he's also given us the perfect manual to help us study and learn and understand the things that God wants out of a man. He did not just rely upon some oral traditions, things that could be twisted over time, just stories that got handed down, but rather instead, the thoughts of God were put together through the Holy Spirit's work so that we have the scriptures to understand what the will of God is. And that's how we attain faith. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We have in our hands not just the written ramblings of a bunch of men, but rather individuals who were inspired of God gave us exactly what God wanted man to know. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 3, going down to verses 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul makes this point, that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all of good works. And God didn't just give us a piece of the story. But he gave us everything that we needed that pertained to life and godliness to help us make good choices and godly decisions. Over in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Now, we may have a book in our hand. And we may have the ability to read, but at the same time, there are some books that are so complicated you can't understand the message. You still have to have a tremendous amount of help to figure it out because the presentation is not clear. But yet we understand in the scriptures that what we have is very understandable. We're going to find some challenging passages. We're going to find some challenging questions. But we can work and lead with others to understand the truth that can get us to heaven. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 4, Whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So God has sent forth teachers. He has added to that the power of godly example that can help others in the world see the power of good. And he has provided us a very complete, inspired instruction manual that we can turn to to find out how to live in such a way as to please him. But the fact of the matter is, we may know the truth. We may understand what we should be doing. But yet there are times when we choose not to comply. It's like with a child growing up in a household. They may know the family rules. They may understand that there are some things that mom and dad have forbidden. But when they get to running with their crowd and they get to having their own desires to do certain things, they're willing to even break the rules sometimes and often wind up in a tremendous amount of trouble as a result of that. And usually then, whenever their misbehavior is exposed, there's some correction that's administered. Something to help them understand this was not a minor thing. This is something that needs to be addressed. This is something that needs to be fixed. This is something that doesn't need to happen again. Well, the Lord does the same thing in using sometimes adversity and misfortune to help us sit up and take notice. And a lot of times when life is all going really well for us, and we're blessed with a lot of wonderful blessings, we kind of start taking things for granted. 
And we can become very lax and lazy when it comes to serving God. And sometimes it takes a little bit of a jolt for us to sit up and take note of the fact that, wait a minute, this is a place of complacency. This is a place of disobedience. This is a place where I should not be. And I need to get some things fixed and changed. That adversity is a chastening rod that helps us to stop and think. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, the Hebrew writer says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? As parents, in loving instruction of their children, they have to teach them right from wrong. And that there are unpleasant consequences when we do that which is wrong, but there are also blessings when we do that which is right. It goes both directions. It's just not all blessings, and I'll just help you do everything that's right and praise you when you do things what's right and ignore the misbehaviors. But rather, while you want to bless that which is good, you also have to deal and instruct in those areas of misbehavior. And that's the way God works with us as well. He has told us how to live. He's taught us how to be righteous. He's taught us to do the things that are right. But at the same time, we have lots and lots of Bible examples of the chastening of the Lord. To get people to set up and take notice of the fact you're way out here where you don't need to be. Think of all the hardships that Israel went through. Whenever they, in their spiritual laziness, turn to idolatry and practicing false religion and doing sinful things, God didn't just say, well, maybe if I bless them enough, they'll finally come back around. He gave them blessings, but it didn't get the job done. Then there would be an invader come into the land, and suddenly they were pushed out of their houses, their crops were taken, they were destitute, they were struggling, and when they didn't know which way to turn, it was, God, can you help us? And as they repented of their waywardness and called upon the name of the Lord, he would call forth a judge or some other leader that would then help them cast off this invader and once again have a chance to get things set right. But they had to endure that chastening to get them to the point of seeing their idolatry was wrong. You're going down a wrong road. There are consequences for iniquity. Many individuals may choose lifestyles that are very self-destructive. Lifestyles that the Bible teaches against condemn certain things as sin. You do these things, you're harming your body. These are things that are not right in the sight of God. But then they begin to suffer maybe even the physical consequences of those choices that they have been making. So whenever we start dealing with some of that, there are times that God may be using that adversity to help us stop and think. Now that's not to say that every single misfortune that happens to us is somehow dished out by the hand of God. Time and chance happens to us all, the scriptures say. There are going to be trials and temptations as well that we're going to have to deal with. But this is just another tool in God's arsenal to say, Dale, you need to take a look at that. Is your life where it needs to be? Whenever you're struggling and trying to figure out why is this not coming together, maybe there is something I need to fix, something I need to change. And so God has a way of throwing up these warning signals to us. Maybe also the lessons are taught by looking at the adversity of others and what they're going through, and we see how they got there. A lot of times with our kids as they were growing up, and when none of their friends kind of hit the wall, they got off in misbehavior and all kinds of consequences befell them, we would say, you know, you kind of see how that happened? It didn't just happen as an accidental thing. There was this, and then they did this, and then they did this, and then they did this. Are you surprised that now calamity has hit? And there are problems that they're going to have to work their way out of. Adversity can be a teacher. It can help us. And God, I think, sometimes extends that rod of correction on us to help us understand, I want you to be saved. 
I want you to do the right stuff. And so listen and learn. Benefit from this back set and see what God would want you to do. And then finally, as we think at, of these things that are tools that God can use in his fight to bring us to repentance, he's also given us a conscience. Something that kind of makes us stop and think. Now here again, a conscience can be misinstructed and needs to be fixed. Sometimes individuals do things with no sense of conscience at all, and they are as wrong as wrong as can be. Because they have, as the scriptures talk about in some places, a seared conscience. It doesn't affect them much anymore. They quit listening to it a long time ago. But as we deal with this bringing up our children, the nurture and admonition of the Lord, as individuals are exposed to the right ways of God, when you know how we should behave and what we should do, and then we fail, it has a way of eating at us and helping us to understand that we could and should do better. Because the conscience is that voice that helps us say, are you sure about this? Is this what should have been done? Are there some amends that you need to make here because of choices that you made? Over in John chapter 8, and going down to verse 9, and, and it says, And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. This is the story of them bringing the woman taken into adultery, and challenging Jesus to what should happen to this woman. The law says she should be, should be stoned. And Jesus just bent and wrote on the ground. Said, he that without sin, you, know, you can cast the first stone. And their conscience began to eat at them. Now, what was going on there? They began to reflect on their own misdeeds. They began to see times when they had not been what they should have been either. They were in sin, just as this woman was in sin. May have been a different topic, may have been a different setting and situation, but what they did was still sinful and wrong. And one by one, as their conscience affected them, they turned and walked away. This scheme was not as foolproof as they thought it was because their own conscience was convicting them of their sin. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and going down to, to verse uh, 12, we find Paul talking about how it is to have a good conscience. He said, for our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that is in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. He said, we have a good conscience in what we've tried to do, how we've tried to teach you, how we have tried to lead you in the right ways of the Lord. Now the Apostle Paul made a statement about his conscience over in Acts chapter 23. And we know what a change occurred in him. Now we talked about a miseducated conscience at the beginning, and that's where Saul of Tarsus started out as a persecutor of Christians. But when he learned better, he changed his behavior. And he then tried just as zealously to do all the right stuff. And so in Acts, in Acts chapter 23 and verse 1, it says, And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God unto this day. And there were some just astounded. In fact, he wound up being smacked over saying something like that because they thought you used to be doing the right stuff because you were a persecutor of Christians and, and you were one of us, and then you changed. Paul changed because he learned better. Paul changed because he had a conversation with the Lord and realized he wasn't on the right road. And he was baptized by Ananias to wash away his sins. Peter talks about how we can attain that good conscience, how we can clear things from our sinful past in the waters of baptism. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, Peter says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, 
It's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but it's the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In our baptism, we can wash away a sinful past. It's okay now. God's forgiven that. And we can then start out on a new path, walking in newness of life. Once again, we see how the conscience can be something to encourage us in doing that which is good. It's, it's a pleasant thing to be able to look back and be able to see victories that were granted by the help of the Lord when we dealt with difficult situations and God pulled us through those things. Whenever we know that in certain situations we did that which was right, that's encouraging. Just as a guilty conscience can be something that keeps us up at night when we know that God's not pleased with where we are and what we're doing. So God's not going to give us up without a fight. He set before us teachers to show us what's right. He set before us the power of godly examples. He has provided for us an instruction manual. He has also provided sometimes the adversity, the misfortune, the chastening that we need to get our attention and to pull us back to righteousness. And he's also given us a conscience to help us stay on that straight and narrow path. He's done all that he can. He's provided the sacrifice for our sins. He's invited us to come. And he said, if you will accept my son, if you will obey the things he's commanded, you can have eternal life. We can have a good conscience, freed from the guilt of our past sins, by being baptized into Christ for the remission of them. And if we stray away and realize our lives are not right in the sight of God, we can turn things around as we repent and pray for forgiveness. So it may be this morning that there are some steps that you need to take to be able to have that right relationship with God. Maybe you, in a sense, hear God kind of calling your way. He's not giving up on you. He wants to see you saved. He wants to see you righteous. He wants to see you in heaven someday. And if there's some steps you need to take even this morning to make your life right in sight of God, we urge you to come. As together we stand and sing the first verse of number 633. And careless soul, why will you linger, wandering from the fold of God? Hear you not the invitation, oh, prepare to meet thy God. A careless soul, oh, heed the warning. Number 297. I want to sing verses 1 and 4 to help us clear our minds and focus upon the sacrifice that was made. When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I see than in thoughts I go to thee the garden of Gethsemane
that night Jesus took the cup and blessed it encouraging his disciples to partake of it in remembrance of his shed blood it took the shedding of blood to have remission of sin Jesus knew his blood was going to be shed in fact he was so weakened apparently by blood loss that even being able to carry the cross out to, to Calvary was something that was a little bit too much but his suffering was intense the blood loss profuse as he was scourged, the crown of thorns on his head, the nails in his hands and feet. Our Father, we're thankful for the suffering of your Son. It was such a thing to go through, but he did it out of love for us. We think of the blood that was shed so that we might have remission of our sins. We pray that as we partake of this fruit of the vine, we will partake of it in a manner well pleasing in your sight. For in Christ's name we pray. Once again, we're grateful for everybody's presence this morning. Glad that you have chosen to come and to be with us. Hope that we've been able to have a worship service that's been pleasing in the sight of God, first and foremost, but something that's been edifying to all of us. One other activity of worship on the first day of the week is to give as we've been prospered, and there are baskets available for you to be able to do that this morning. Once again, we're thankful for your presence. Let's stand and sing the first verse of number 657. And then we'll close our time together with a word of prayer. Be not dismayed, whatever be time, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. 
are thankful for this time that we can share. We are thankful for this period of worship and for all that it can mean to us. Pray that you will bless us now throughout this day and through the upcoming week, that we may strive to do your will in every way, that we will be obedient to the commands of the truth, that we will strive to be the proper example before the world. Father, we pray that you will forgive us of our sins and shortcomings, but help us to have a greater resolve to be more of what you would want us to be with a burning desire to one day be with you in heaven. Forgive us of our sins, be with the many of the sick. Help us to always to choose to do that which is right. And one day save us in heaven. We humbly ask in Jesus' name. Amen.